What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks, presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers. DJ, Bucky, and our good friend, Rhett Lewis, with us here as we get a chance to look back at a weekend of football, guys. That was pretty spectacular. Uh, Buck, you were at the Jags game, which was an incredible game, a competitive game against the Commanders. Rhett, you're out. You're all over the place. You're calling the Indiana yep. football game. Then you're coming back in studio, uh, getting everybody covered for all of the Sunday slate. And I saw a good yep. matchup. Uh, with the Chargers and the Raiders in the AFC West. Uh, guys, I, we got a full show today. We're going to get a chance to talk about some surprises. We're going to get a chance to talk some college football. But off the top here, uh, we got to talk about the big three. And, Buck, I want to get to you first here on this first game, which was steelers Bengals, which was absolutely wild. All the turnovers for Burrow, yet they still have a chance to win it. But somehow Minka Fitzpatrick found a way to take this football game over early and late. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think Minka Fitzpatrick is the one that stood out to me because he played himself into the Defensive Player of the Year uh, award in one game. When you think about what he was able to do, big time interception, comes off the edge, blocks a, a critical uh, PAT at the end to give them a chance. Those are the kind of things that you expect to see from your five-star players on the back end. And then I got to give a lot of credit to Mike Tomlin and what this team is always able to overcome. You lose T.J. Watt, you're playing with a quarterback, Mr. Trubisky, who's still trying to figure it out. But this team just finds a way to get to the winner's circle. So hats off to the Steelers, hats off to Mike Tomlin. They just find a way to continue to keep, keep it on in spite of the circumstances that sometimes are challenging in front of them. Yeah, and DJ, looking at the other side of things with the Bengals, I mean, this was a disaster uh, based on all of the commitment that the Bengals had made to improving the biggest area of weakness on this entire team a year ago, which was the offensive line. You got four new starters up there. Went out and made a couple of splashes in free agency, Lyle Collins, Kappa, Karras, that whole crew. And then, you know, you're pressured more, almost 10% more on dropbacks in this game than Joe Burrow was the entire season on average a year ago. A seven sacks, four interceptions, completely uncharacteristic performance from Burrow. Some of those picks were on him. Some of them were as a result of pressure. Everyone took their lumps in the protection department along the offensive line. But the biggest disappointment to me, if I'm a Bengals fan, is the one guy that we were counting on. The one mainstay along the offensive line, Jonah Williams, he got whooped a couple of times by Alex Highsmith, who ended up with three sacks more on him and a little bit later. Um, but right now, if you spent all that money and all that commitment to try to improve this offensive line, I know it's only week one. We'll say that a, a number of times in this show, but that's trouble. Yeah, Red, I, you know, the interesting thing is I, I look at a lot of these week one games and we'll go through a bunch of them and you don't want to get carried away. It's one result. Let's not get too nuts here, you know, making these drastic takeaways. Uh, but when I look at the kind of the underlying factors here for the Bengals, it feels a lot like last year. I mean, they still were in a position to win the football game despite all those turnovers, all those sacks, because Jamar exactly Chase right. is still an elite player. When you had to have a drive, Joe Burrow was able to deliver a drive. They make that PAT. We're talking about, man, they've been able to overcome these offensive line issues, the turnover issues. They still have their stars. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. Don't panic, Bengals fans. They're going to get better. They're going to get better up front. They're not going to have turnover games like this often. Uh, I, I want to give the Steelers their credit, though, for just kind of a gritty win. I mean, I thought Trubisky was steady and solid. I don't think there's anything spectacular about the way he played. Uh, but they found their way into the winner's circle. Uh, it is a concern, though, with the T.J. Watt injury. It sounds like not career, not season-ending, uh, but is going to mm -hmm. miss a few weeks here. And that is a big piece uh, to their defense. But we, we said at the beginning of the year, Buck, the Steelers, they're a team that bad years for them are 500 years. Like, even if there's yeah. kind of a little bit of a rebuild taking place, now you gotta they're gonna show up to play each and every week. Yeah, they do show up to play. And I think Mike Tomlin hit the nail on the head in his post-game presser. He talked about the new guys coming in and playing up to the standard and how impressive that was that guys who haven't been around the team, guys who don't understand what the organization is about, they were able to come in and kind of live up to their their motto. Mike Tomlin always talks about the standard is the standard. And so when you are an organization that's won, I think, six Super Bowls. That's kind of how you get down. And so those guys played to a championship yeah. spirit. They were able to get a big win, a surprising win against the uh, defending AFC champions. Yeah, but you got to watch out for the Najee Harris injury, too. He was already dealing with a little bit of a Liz Frank issue and then had to leave the game late. So, you, you know, you're looking at the possibility of losing, you know, your best defensive player and arguably your best offensive player as well uh, moving forward in a very tough division. 
Yeah, no doubt. Uh, hey, good win, though, uh, for the Pittsburgh yeah. Steelers. Gutted that one out in overtime. Uh, the game I was at, Raiders-Chargers. AFC West been the most hyped division in the offseason. Kind of an arms race, so to speak, with all the additions that were made. Uh, we saw that Raiders defensive front with Chandler Jones and Max Crosby. Chargers offensive line, I thought, did a, did a nice job. They hung in there, didn't give up any sacks. You flip it over to the other side, and Rhett, you've got a Charger defense with Khalil Mack showing he's not hey. done yet. Three sacks for him. <laughs> Bosa has a sack on a, on a trick play. They try to run a, a reverse pass. They're almost like a Philly special. He sniffs that one out. Uh, but I thought the Charger defense was, was excellent. And I thought, look, Justin Herbert, no Keenan Allen. He goes out of the game early. Didn't seem to matter. He's throwing the touchdowns to whoever's open. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, pick your poison for sure. And I think what the one thing that kind of flew under the radar with all those massive quarterback transactions this offseason was the upgrade on the defensive side of the ball by the L.A. Chargers. And we didn't even see the main free agent acquisition, right, with J.C. Jackson out for the game, and they still handled. Um, I thought, you know, De- Devontae Adams got his yards, but I thought they handled the other options and, and Waller and Renfro very well uh, in this game. And as you mentioned, um, you know, we're now one of the best pass rushing tandems in the league. We talked – about the Raiders in that vein quite a bit with Max Crosby and Chandler Jones. Jones shut out in the second half. I don't think he had a single pressure uh, on Rashawn Slater's side. But Bosa and Mack combining for 16 pressures, both of them getting uh, generating pressure on over 20% of their rushes, I mean, that's winning football on the defensive side. And especially in that division where the quarterback play is so good and expected to be so good all year long, They have to count on that each and every week. And I know, DJ, you were pretty interested in, um, you know, the way that Derwin James was used in this game kind of all over the place. Yeah, it it was ridiculous. But we were talking about this a little bit earlier uh, before we started. I mean, it's just unbelievable. When you have Derwin James in man coverage at times against Hunter Renfro, against Darren Waller, the last play of the game, he actually travels with Devontae (laughs) Adams. Then you have a sack where he runs through Josh Jacobs. He's playing high. I mean, Buck, you know this kid all the way going back to high school. So every time I tell you something I've seen with Derwin James or being around him, you always remind me this is something you saw in an 18-year-old kid. Yeah, he's one of the more special players that we have seen in National Football League. His versatility uh, allows Brandon Staley to do whatever he wants to do on defense. He talked about him being a superstar and a racer. DJ, we've used that term in terms of you can put Derwin James wherever you need to put him to erase the threat that the other team has. And so in watching your tweet, because you tweeted this out after watching the game, you said he lined up outside on Devontae Adams. He lined up inside and outside on Darren mm-hmm. Waller. Hunter Renfro came in the box, blitz, uh, played in the deep middle, had a big hit. He does everything that you want to see. And so he is the model of the new school safety that you want. A guy who is that chess piece that you put somewhere on the second level of the defense with an ever-changing job description. That's Derwin James, because Derwin James is, without question, one of the best football players in the National Football League. He gave us a small glimpse of his many talents as a big-time playmaker. Yeah, you know, look, guys, I I will kind of summarize this one and wrap it up. This is going to be a contested division. Every game is going to be like this one, where you've got a team with the ball in their hands, a chance to go down and win it. Uh, I feel spoiled getting a chance to call these Charger games because all of them are, are close, all of them are competitive, all of them are entertaining. And here you go, turn around. They got to play on Thursday at Kansas City, a, a team we'll Let's talk go. about a little bit later Let's that go. got off to a very hot start. So this uh, this AFC West is not going to disappoint. Uh, the third game. Let's go. Uh, let's go Bucks Cowboys for the, yeah. the third biggest game of the weekend in terms of the takeaways. I mean, guys. Buck, this was futility uh, on the part of the Dallas Cowboys. We'll give the Bucks their flowers. They played great defense. Uh, they were able to get out of there with a win. But, man, the story of this one, not just the Dak injury, which is going to sideline him for a while. They look terrible with Dak offensively. Bad, bad football. Yeah, bad football, a lot of bad football. And to me, if you are a Cowboys fan and you're a Cowboys front office exec, you have to look at the team that was on the field. And you have to ask yourself, did we really get better when we traded away Amari Cooper? Because in my mind, when you traded away Amari Cooper, you reset the pecking order of the passing game. Now, C.D. Lamb goes from number two to number one. Michael Gallup, who you're counting on to be a number two, is really a number three. And then all the other unheralded guys are now on the field. Well, now you remove Michael Gallup. It's C.D. Lamb and a cast of no names. And unfortunately, they needed the no names to make plays. And they couldn't create separation. They couldn't get open. It disrupted the timing and the rhythm of the passing game. And then when you know that the opponent is struggling, you don't let up off the gas. Ty Bowles kept the pressure on them, kept coming after them. Guys never were able to settle in and find a rhythm as playmakers. 
It, yeah, look, I, I think I'll double down on that because the numbers kind of bear that out a little bit, that lack of the ability to win on the outside, outside of C.D. Lamb. Uh, Dak Prescott, just four completions in this ballgame targeting receivers out wide. Okay, that's one part of it, right? The next part of it is he was sub 50% completion when he had two and a half seconds to throw or more, right? So when he had time to throw, he's sitting back there looking, looking, and not finding anybody open in a way that's going to generate a completion. So, you know, that goes back to Michael Gallup not being ready, not out there uh, after the ACL injury last year. And I think that's part of the reasoning. You know, you're like, okay, we'll send Amari Cooper on his way. We think Michael Gallup, we're going to pay him. And we think he's going to be the type of player that provides the compliment to CD lamb, maybe jumps in there as the number two. Uh, and then they go out and sign James Washington. He gets hurt. So he's hurt Gallup's out. And now CD lamb is the guy getting all the attention with Dalton Schultz in there should be a bigger part of the game plan too. It was a guy who had the third most receptions of any tight end in football a year ago. Um, and then, you know, the run game was okay. Um, I, I guess, but, Offensive line wise, they're still letting up pressures there against Dak. And and then when he did have the time to throw, there just wasn't a lot of options out there. The one thing that they can hang their hat on, though, uh, DJ, Micah Parsons pressuring the quarterback. Yeah. My goodness. I mean, he was a game wrecker oh, yeah, on the defensive sure. side of the ball once again. No, he was phenomenal. I, I'll, I'll just leave you with this, Buck. I remember the story about Tom Moore as the offensive coordinator for the Colts with Peyton Manning. Somebody once asked him, how many reps do you give your backup quarterback when Peyton was there? And he said, look, if Peyton gets hurt, we're screwed. Why would we yep. want to practice being screwed? Okay? He gets none. <laughs> Peyton gets 100% of the reps. I, I don't know that there's a team with a greater disparity between starter and backup. That I, I don't see how this team's going to get their way to the winner's circle with Cooper Rush. I, I, God, God bless him. I think he's a competitive. He's, he's tough. This is a major problem for them right now with Dak missing time. Dak was rusty. I think Dak, that, I'll chalk that up to just some rust. He didn't play well. Yeah. I got the sense oh, he'll be fine. He'll work it all out. But, man, Buck, you go from Dak Prescott to Cooper Rush and your offensive line is in shambles. Uh, this, is a, this is no bueno for the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, not good for the Dallas Cowboys at all. And it's one of the things where defense played great. Defense held the 10 Bay Buccaneers to 19 points. The rule of thumb in the National Football League, if you hold – teams to about 17 more games than not you're going to win yeah. so they did a really good job keeping the ball in front not letting the Buccaneers leak out didn't give up any big explosive plays offensively they couldn't get it going and when I look at this team I just don't know if they really know what their identity is because when you look at how you portray yourself or how you say you want to play and then you look at the stat sheet, it doesn't line up. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, the one trade, we don't see division trades very often, but man, Howie Roseman's such a wheeler dealer. I wonder if he calls in the division to their heated rival and says, hey, Minshew. you want to give me a two for Gardner Minshew? Yeah, give, give, me, give me a two. We'll, we'll, we'll make something happen here. I don't think would that's going to happen, but it'd be Would fun. he it'd give up a, a six to get Minshew? That'd be quite a deal. Yeah, turn him around, turn Minshew from a six to a yeah. two. Desperate, desperate times, desperate measures. Uh, we'll see right here. Uh, <laughs> going forward, what the Cowboys do. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we're going to come back with eight surprises in week one. It was tough to narrow it down. There's a bunch of surprises here yeah. as we kick off the NFL season. All right, back by popular demand. We're going to keep the Elite Eight yes. theme going again this year. And, guys, uh, we're going to look at eight surprises from week one because it was a bonkers week in terms of what expectations and what we actually got. There were surprises galore. I, I can kick it off with us here uh, with yeah. the Giants and Saquon Barkley and seeing the guy that we all thought we would see when he came into this league. Uh, just a mm. reminder, when he's healthy, he's as good as we have in terms of the explosiveness in the backfield. Eight, 18 for a buck 64 and a touchdown on the ground. Also caught six balls. This offense, we talked all offseason about Daniel Jones and this prove-it year and where are the weapons going to come from. Well, it turns out, you know, Buck, the, the biggest weapon is the guy lined up right behind him. Yeah, absolutely. He's, he's a big weapon. And what I love about this is Brian Dayball found a way to tap into his many talents. One, he got 18 carries, which is more than enough for Saquon Barkley to pop out. We talk about him being a guy that can have a few negative runs, then he has a big one to make up for it when it comes to average. But having the trust to give the ball to him in a two-point two situation to win the yeah. game, I love it. We talked about what Brian Dayball was able to do with Josh Allen. I think Saquon Barkley might be the next pupil that we talk about kind of benefiting from his success and his wise words. 
Yeah, I mean, I, the, I thought that was uh, one of the biggest revelations of this entire uh, week one, and it was the explosive plays, right? I mean, like the Giants offense, you know, has been anemic in general, and they've been without chunk plays, big runs, runs of 10 plus. They had a run of 60 plus in this game with Saquon Barkley. And then I, I loved how Daniel Jones bounced back after the red zone interception. He comes back in and uh, and ends up getting them down there for the go-ahead touchdown and two-point conversion. So uh, let's keep it moving, though, on the Elite Eight here, Bucky. What do you got? I got the Washington Commanders in their diversified offense. Uh, I got to give my flowers to Scott Turner, offense coordinator for the Commanders. He did a great job of utilizing all the weapons. And a lot of the focus and attention will be on Carson Wentz. But let me tell you, sitting there watching it, Curtis Samuel and Antonio Gibson had big games because what they did is they tapped into their old uh, wide receiver mentalities and bodies, meaning they were used in the backfield, they were used out of space, they got handoffs, they got plenty of receptions, and because they were so dynamic and it was so creative and clever, how Scott Turner utilized them, the Jacks could never really get a sense of where they're at and what they're doing. That enabled Carson Wentz to get comfortable because it was a bunch of easy throws, little pitch and catch. He got his confidence going, and then that offense started rolling. But let me also give Carson Wentz some credit. Had a couple of bad turnovers to the point where you're in the fourth quarter and you wonder, is this when the meltdown happens? comes right back, hits Terry McLaurin on a big touchdown, a beautiful ball, and then he ices the game with a teardrop to John Dotson. Washington Commanders had it going, and I think you could see what it could look like with Carson Wentz when he's playing at his best. Yeah, I, I would agree. I thought that was fast. awesome to see. Yeah. You know, Red, yeah, that, that, that was I, that's just my quick my quick tag on that. That's just That looked like a fast football team. There's some things – you know, we're going to see as the, as the season rolls along that this week one can be a little bit of an outlier. You don't read too much into it. But a team's fast, they're fast. And to me, Rhett, when I watched that Washington team, I was like, okay, they're fast. They got legit speed out there. Yeah, and we saw Curtis Samuel really for the first time it felt like in a commander's uniform since he came over from the Panthers. So they got a nice little triple-headed, uh, three-headed monster uh, with the wide receivers. All right, let me get to my uh, my first lead eight here. And I'm going to go down to Houston where the Texans had a 20 to three lead in a game that nobody really expected them to be in against the Indianapolis Colts. And OJ Howard was one of the biggest reasons why. Yes, OJ Howard, who began this preseason with the Buffalo Bills, was cut there after a few seasons with the Tampa Bay Bucks. You remember him as a first round pick out of Alabama. Uh, and he comes in and made the most of his two receptions. Both of them went for touchdowns. So OJ Howard, uh, who had just one touchdown all of last season and three all of the last two years, ends up with two in week one for the Texans. Big ones from Davis Mills there. And I know they came out with the tie. I don't know how we feel about that. But I think Houston Texans fans can feel pretty good about uh, a nice little acquisition before the season started, getting OJ Howard in there. Uh, that was a nice one. Look, at to me, that's a, great, a team. That was a big surprise, yeah. Buck, just how competitive they were. Yeah, Lovey Smith had them going. They were up 20 to 3. And you thought, man, are, are the Texans going to blow the Indianapolis Colts yeah. out? They let the Colts slip back in. But to their credit, they were able to walk out with the tie. O.J. Howard coming off the street, being able to control the middle of the field. I like what the Texans are doing. You get a big target like that who's athletic enough to be able to control the seams. Easiest throw for the quarterback is right down the middle. They're trying to help the young quarterback continue to grow and progress. Yeah, hey, good on the uh, good on the Houston Texans putting on a good show, being competitive. Uh, I'm going to go to the Bears. That might be one of the most surprising ones of the whole weekend. 49ers, a team I thought you know, a chance to be a Super Bowl team. I know there's bad weather. Um, and I know people are going to pile on Trey Lance and kill him for this performance. wasn't great. Uh, let's yeah. just let's slow down a little bit on that one. But on the Bears side of things, I like the game plan. Going back and watching that tape. Offensive line was a concern. They still got beat up a little bit, but I thought they let Justin Fields grow into this game. This throw obviously was very late in the ball game, but early on, guys, it was checkdowns, it was screens, it was moving the pocket. And then as the game got going and got later into the game, he saw his confidence grow. This was an unbelievable play here as he's getting out to the left and just find an uncovered receiver over to the other side of the field. But that, that to me, was big. Let field settle into this game. Don't lose this game early, Buck, with a young quarterback and bad weather against a good defense. I thought they let him kind of ease into the ball game. Yeah, DJ, there's a saying, more games are lost than won. So the early part of the game, what you're trying to do is avoid making those losing plays, turning it over, having pre snap penalties and those things. When you have a young quarterback playing in a new system with a suspect offensive line, don't put him in harm's way. 
always elect to take the more conservative approach, ease him into the game, and then let him go after it. And when you had an opportunity to dial it up, man, he dialed it up. And you're the 49ers, you're looking across the field, you see Justin Fields getting it going. You certainly hope that Trey Lance would be able to play like that. But if I'm a Bears fan, I'm really excited because the defense and Fields, that gives us a chance to win games. I'm a little concerned if I'm the 49ers in the run game. Um, you know, this, that was a game that was built for them to go out there and just kind of mash it, right, with the rain and the weather. And, and that's a team that's built for that kind of game. And it, it just didn't take over on that side of the ball in the run game. I mean, Trey Lance wasn't very effective uh, running the football either. And then Eli Mitchell goes down uh, after dealing with an injury for much of the preseason. He goes down and then has to leave and does not come back uh, after a knee injury. So, uh, you know, this is a team I feel like they – that kid, you know, they get snake bitten with injuries at the running back spot, but somebody else is always there to pick up the slack. It sounds like Jeff Wilson will be that next guy to get the rock for the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, Jeff Wilson, it gets the rock. The 49ers will continue to find a way to run the ball. The system will eventually help them have success. Speaking of systems, how about the Kansas City Chiefs and their system, Pat Mahomes? Woo. Number 15 kind of quelled some of the concerns about the Kansas City Chiefs offense being able to exist without Tyreek Hill, put on an outstanding performance against the Arizona Cardinals. Five touchdown passes. I mean, four different dudes being able to touch it, throwing all over the yard, making sure he used every option in the progression. And I've said this, I feel like it's going to be addition by subtraction. Not necessarily that the team is better because Tyreek Hill is there. I expect Pat Mahomes to be better because now He's going to play a little more traditional quarterback, a little more in terms of staying with the reads. And as he gets better, just kind of taking what the defense gives him, it now makes a guy who's already dangerous as an MVP scary because now he can utilize all the things. He has a bunch of more tools to be able to use to be able to attack the defense. Well, how many times have we seen the stat about Andy Reid coming off of a bye? Uh, Andy Reid has an extra week to prepare. You're in trouble. Andy Reid has an off season to prepare. Good luck. Uh, good luck, everybody. He's going to dial it up, and they're going to execute at a very high level. I think it's, this test is going to be Thursday night. Chiefs, Chargers, Derwin James, and Kelsey. That seems to be the matchup they've had over the last few years. And when Derwin's been healthy out there, it, it's been competitive. He's done a really nice job. So you can say they're spreading the ball around. This still is Travis Kelsey, eight for a buck, 21 and a touchdown. Right. He is still their premier guy. So I want to see a game where that gets kind of taken away. And then what do the rest of these guys do to step up around Patrick Mahomes? That's a heck of a start against the Arizona Cardinals. But I think we'll learn a lot more about this team uh, when they play the Chargers on Thursday night. All right, Rhett, keep us going here. What's the next one? Yeah, and I'll just say, by the way, uh, Clyde edwards helaire getting himself in the end zone a couple of times in the past game, kind of something that, that got lost in the shuffle over the course of this offseason as, as another guy that can be a piece of that pass game. All right, I'll keep it moving. Going back to that uh, Cincinnati Bengals and Pittsburgh Steelers game, this is maybe counterculture to the, uh, the Tom Moore uh, philosophy here, um, but uh, you do have a backup long snapper right in case of emergency and unfortunately that emergency I had to break the glass in Cincinnati uh, yesterday because uh, Clark Harris the normal long snapper both on punts and field goals ended up with a torn biceps as uh, Tom Pelissero has just reported which is you know obviously bad news for Cincinnati which forced Mitchell Wilcox in there as the backup long snapper and I was reading a, a tweet from Mike Giardi our pal here at NFL Network earlier and and he was had a quote from um, Wilcox had said, yeah, I wish I would have had more time. I wish I would have been able to practice more field goal snaps. I'm mostly just work on punt snaps. And I was like, well, wait a second. It, th that'd be like the backup quarterback saying like, ah, I only worked on handoffs this week. I didn't really get any work in, in the past game like that. You got points on the line there. And so they had an opportunity with just an extra point to, to win that thing in overtime after a burrow to Jamar Chase touchdown. Operation bad, slow snap coming back. Minka Fitzpatrick comes off the edge, blocks it. And then a terrible snap on the field goal that would have won it. Another gimme in overtime. It's too high. Holder gives him full laces. McPherson shanks it. Credit to McPherson for putting it all on himself. But, um, yeah, you're going to have to go out and sign a long snapper now. Because I, I think Mitchell Wilcox is going to go back to – Mitch Wilcox is going to go back to, um, you know, his day job, uh, which, you know, being a tight end kind of H-back type of situation there in Cincinnati. You want political analysis, you're going to go to John King, okay? And you want holder, <laughs> snapper, operation, you want operation analysis, analysis when it comes that's to what special I'm here for, teams. Man. Yeah. That's where you go to all Big Ten holder. 
uh, Rhett Lewis to get that type of a breakdown there. Nicely done. Nicely done. I'm going to spare our audience and, and not continue that conversation. Uh, Bucky, what's the next one? Hey, look, man, Jarvis Landry uh, reemerging as a big-time player down in New Orleans. Really excited about the Saints offense because you just wanted it with so many weapons. Eventually, you know they're going to figure it out. Jarvis Landry comes back, comes, comes back home, and, man, over 100 yards, seven catches, makes a big catch down the boundary to kind of set up the game-winning uh, field goal. But then it's him working with Michael Thomas, two veteran players who played at high levels, who caught a ton of balls, and now they're willing to sacrifice to help each other out. When I look at this offense and I think about Jameis Winston being able to push the ball down the field, but also having a chain mover like Jarvis Landry, also having a guy in space in Alvin Kamara who can create and exploit mismatches, everything is there for the Saints to play at a high level. And if they play at a high level, that means that Jameis Winston's played at a high level and he'll get the attention that he deserves. Yeah, yeah it was me, nice to the see. The return of Michael Thomas was big too. I mean, that was big getting Two Michael Thomas back there with Jarvis Landry, Rhett. Yeah, and they didn't really they, they didn't really have the run game that I kind of expected to see with Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram. Uh, that was shut down for the most part by the Atlanta Falcons, uh, who, by the way, got some nice play from their rookie receiver, Drake London, five catches and 70-plus yards uh, to go along there with Kyle Pitts. Big receiving core in Atlanta. I think there's a lot to be kind of fired up about there if you're Atlanta uh, moving forward here. Some pretty good play against a good team in the Saints in a division matchup, but you can't let that 16-point lead go in the second in the fourth quarter. That's just certainly can't do that. All right, let me move forward. Uh, final Elite Eight takeaway here. I'm surprised that Baker Mayfield didn't go out and win a revenge game. I feel like that's what his whole persona is built on, is like thriving on those opportunities to go out and prove people wrong. And to his credit, he got the Panthers in position uh, to get the win with a go-ahead touchdown late. So I'm throw that uh, ball right into the Panthers' eye in the back of the, uh, on that graphic on the back of the wall. Uh, and that was a money toss right there in celebration of that touchdown. And then, you know, it just it, the defense goes in and allows the Browns to move down in position for a game-winning field goal. Um, and we'll have more on the game-winning field goal kicker there in Cleveland here in just a little bit. But I just, you know, that was that was a game just based on his persona. I was like, all right, that Baker Mayfield's going to find a way to win that game. I, I think that the good news there is they showed some things on offense to be excited about moving forward. Robbie Anderson, explosive play. Christian McCaffrey still healthy. Uh, and available moving forward, uh, which is obviously a good thing. And when he's there, this offense always has a chance. Yeah, when he's there, they always have a chance. I think it was a really solid showing for Baker after you got past the first part, a little slow, but then he yeah. settled in. And what we saw was vintage Baker. Baker bringing him back. We saw the momentum kind of flip in the direction of the Panthers. We also saw them have the energy and the big plays start to pop up. So I believe in a month when Baker fully knows the offense and is fully able to not only call the plays, but recall them and know them and be able to put his own stamp on this team. I think you see this team take a mid-season jump as he gets comfortable at quarterback. Yeah, and on the other side of that, guys, the Cleveland Browns, I mean, the goals, let's just kind of hover around 500 until you get Deshaun Watson uh, towards the end of the season. Can you yeah. stay in the race? Can you stay in the playoff hunt? Big first win. a good start with a big, big win there in week number one. All right, it's time to show your good side presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers. And this is where we're going to look at our, our favorite performance of week one. And uh, guys, I'll kick us off here. And I'm going to go to the Minnesota Vikings, a dominant win over the Green Bay Packers, a dominant performance by their stud wide receiver and Justin Jefferson. How's this for numbers to get things started here? 155 yards. And I don't, the separation we'll see with the next gen stat numbers had to be extraordinary because he was giving Kirk Cousins tremendously easy throws like the one you just saw right there, winning at the line of scrimmage, winning at the top of the route. Buck, he can make a quarterback's life pretty easy when you got somebody like Justin Jefferson doing what he did against the Packers. I mean, outstanding performance from Justin Jefferson. I was really excited to see Kevin O'Connell change up this offense. This offense was attack, attack, attack. Part of that was because Justin Jefferson was getting open early and often. Let's go to Philadelphia. Well, it was in Detroit, but I'm talking about the Philadelphia Eagles. How about Jalen Hurts? And the job that Jalen Hurts was able to do against the Detroit Lions. Dude had over 330 scrimmage yards, throwing it, running it, making plays. You couldn't really stop him as a runner. He found a way to get the ball to A.J. Brown, really brought him into the fold early. And the Philadelphia Eagles get this kind of quarterback play. Regardless of whether the yards are through the air or on the ground, they're going to be a tough team. Uh, like where uh, Jalen Hurst is, I like how he's trending. 
Yeah, speaking of toughness, uh, I almost included this as one of my surprises. I was almost surprised that the Lions did not pull off the comeback in this game. They scored back-to-back -to -back touchdowns to close it out, just could not get a stop in the final three and a half minutes. Credit to the Eagles uh, for running some really good four-minute offense there. But it just felt like a game with the grit and with the personality of Dan Campbell that, you know, that we saw in hard knocks all summer long. Like, that's – I was like, all right, the Lions are going to come back and win this thing. They just fell a little bit short. Uh, all right, I'm going to get to my standout performer. Again, going back to that – Bengals game um, as they Joe Burrow was under constant pressure. Obviously, the defensive player of the year from a year ago, TJ Watt, played a big role in that. But how about Alex Highsmith, who is really coming on as an edge rusher, uh, fits perfectly in this Pittsburgh scheme. He gets nine total pressures and gets home three different times. Again, um, making uh, some good work of Jonah Williams, who I think we all kind of felt like was the Bengals' best offensive lineman coming into this season. So uh, that, that makes for trouble for Cincinnati, but you got to feel pretty good about Pittsburgh, even if you got to lose TJ Watt for an extended period of time, that you got a guy that can get after the quarterback on a consistent basis. And Alex Highsmith uh, getting it done there, uh, bringing a little Conference USA into the Steelers' pass rush. Well, there you go. Conference USA, big performance by Highsmith. You mentioned the injury to TJ Watt. Thankfully, it looks like not, not for the whole season, so get him back at some point in time. I do want yeah. to touch quickly before we go to break here. Uh, Buck, you, you're talking about Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown. I talked about Justin Jefferson. You think about the Eagles. Everything's been made of them, you know, not selecting Justin Jefferson, and he's an unbelievable player. But hat tip to Howie Roseman. Eventually, being aggressive, being bold, go out and get A.J. Brown to be that number one wide receiver and so far, uh, paying early dividends. Time for Battles 1 presented by the United States Marine Corps and looking at a rivalry football game in the NFL before we get to really the highlight of the weekend, which was something that took place in college football. Uh, but Buck, the Atlanta Falcons and New Orleans Saints, big time rivalry between those two organizations. Not a lot of love lost. A game that the Saints end up winning, but I want to get to you on the Falcon side of things because to me, the, the, the way they played offensively, hat tip to Arthur Smith and they have some exciting young pieces over there. Yeah, hat tip to Arthur Smith. did a really good job of getting this team to run out to a lead. And they had control of the game until they just kind of fell apart in the fourth quarter. You saw Cordero Patterson have a big game, had an opportunity to make the rush for over 100 yards. Then you look at Marcus Mariota, how he took care of the football and kind of got it out to the playmakers and needed to think. If you're the Atlanta Falcons, you hate losing the way that you lost, but there are definitely some things that you can build upon. Maybe I think things are looking up in Atlanta. Arthur Smith's a really a good head coach. Yeah, gosh, I'd agree with that as well. And, you know, I was looking at this, um, you know, from the Saints side of things. Uh, offensively, man, Michael Thomas is back. Two touchdown catches in this game. Chris Olave caught all three of his targets from Jameis Winston. So another rookie receiver there, um, you know, with some quality play in their NFL debut. And then, of course, Jarvis Landry, Bucky, you already mentioned over 100 yards, a guy that Jameis can count on. And then eventually you're going to see Alvin Kamara make some plays. So like th this, this offense is humming already. Jameis, nice work there. Even without Sean Payton, felt like this offense, you know, it took a little time, took, you know, first couple of quarters to get things going a little bit. And then they, they hit their stride down the stretch. Terrific comeback. But uh, Atlanta, Atlanta fans, man, I mean, they just, they got to be tired of uh, seeing this uh, fourth quarter script play out, you know? Yeah, it's <laughs> become a little bit of a theme so there. But look, Drake London. Five for 74 as a rookie. He looked good. You Feel look good at Michael Thomas on one side, that's the, that's, that's the comp for him and how you can use him. Big slot, you can use him outside, lots of separation, big wingspan. Um, he's going to be a really good one. In a game where you don't really get anything out of Kyle Pitts for them to be in a position to, uh, to win that football game, I think that's a yeah. positive sign for the Atlanta Falcons.